Hello class and welcome to this lecture on monopoly in our course on microeconomics. As we have discussed before, we are now on our fourth and final market structure. We initially talked about perfect competition, then we talked about monopolistic competition, we most recently talked about oligopoly, and now we're wrapping up the entire unit by talking about monopoly. So what allows for a firm to be a monopoly? Well, we've been discussing constantly about the level of competition in terms of how many other firms are producing that good or service, whether the product is differentiated or not, and finally, the discussion about whether it's easy to enter the industry as a new firm or whether there is a difficult barrier to entry. When you have a monopoly, you only have one firm. There's only one person selling the product, which results in the product being unique. Nobody else can make that product or nobody else is making that product or else there would be more than one firm. And then lastly, entry is blocked for outside firms. Now, the way it can be blocked can be for a variety of reasons. It could be due to economies of scale. It could be due to controlling a resource. It could also be through government acquiescence in terms of the fact that they have approved either a patent or some sort of public franchise option. The reality is is that monopolies are frowned upon. So we had the Sherman Antitrust Act that was passed in the late 1800s and another antitrust act passed in the early 20th century. We have a board game about monopoly that makes your family get into arguments and fist fights because of the fact that you're basically bankrupting everybody else. Monopolies are historically frowned upon because they restrict supply and they increase prices for consumers. And we will demonstrate that concept moving forward. But essentially, that is kind of the drawback of monopolies. However, there are some types of monopolies that are approved by the government uh, in order to promote some sort of economic advancement or growth. What causes a monopoly? So there are a number of ways in which a monopoly can occur. The first two that we're going to focus on are government uh, approved monopolies in a way. So government action can cause a monopoly to occur. The first one is patents. So when we talked about oligopolies, we talked about patents and the fact that basically a patent gives you the right to exclude others from producing a good or service or that is claimed within the terms of the patent. And you basically have that monopoly right potentially for up to 20 years from the filing date. Now, most patents take about 18 months to three years to be approved. So really you're looking at 17 years to 18 and a half years. However, in the pharmaceutical industry, it takes about eight to 10 years for pharmaceutical drugs to be approved by the FDA. So you're actually looking at more like 10 years. But regardless, assuming that there isn't any other patent governing your ability to utilize your patent because some patents like we talked about with the pencil with the eraser can just be an improvement on an existing technology it's not come you don't have to completely invent something new it has to be new useful not not obvious but it doesn't have to be something that's coming out of thin air it could be just kind of improving or building upon something that already exists now if you do pre create something that's innovative or revolutionary or something that's kind of out of thin air or uh, is improving upon something that did have a patent maybe in the past but no longer uh, is patent patented or the patent is expired on it, then you effectively can have a monopoly on that product. Now, again, depending on how restrictive and narrow your claims or broad your claims are, uh, that could be a patent that allows for you to exist and have a differentiation ability in a monopolistically competitive space. It could get you into an oligopoly space like Amazon did, or it could just restrict all competition. So particularly when we're looking at pharmaceutical drugs, that is a monopoly that that pharmaceutical company now has over that drug for as long as the patent exists. So there are drawbacks of monopolies in this case. We've heard about price gouging of EpiPens and other life-saving drugs by uh, corporation, corporate leaders in pharmaceutical industry and other industries. 
But the reason why patents exist is due to this trade-off. Basically, it's been codified in the Constitution that a patent should be allowed. And, to, and the reason why it's codified in the Constitution is because it's supposed to promote the useful progress in arts and sciences. So copyrights and patents exist because the goal is by basically a trade-off of you publicly disclosing the information that is claimed that once that uh, monopoly right expires, now it's available for all citizens of the nation and the world to be able to utilize that technology to promote the sciences and move us further into the future. Now, the level of whether or not it's long enough, too long, should it depend on the type of thing uh, that's being patented, whether it's a design or a plant or a utility patent, those are up for debate. But generally speaking, the trade-off is that we give a temporary monopoly right to incentivize people to be able to take on uh, these new risks and research and development to come up with new ideas and opportunities. Uh, so the reason why it exists is because you could take a lot of time coming up with this creative, innovative idea, and it's very effective. But then if there wasn't a patent protection, then some corporation could ride the coattails of all of your hard work and then basically put you out of business because of the fact that they have the economies of scale and the marketing ability to basically make it seem like you never existed and that you stole the idea from them when it's the other way around. The other type of government action could be a public franchise. So this is basically when the government designates a firm as the only provider of a good or service. So you might think of this in terms of public utilities. So like the electric company or the gas company or the water company, a public franchise could actually just be run by the government. So in other countries, it could be like an entire sector of the industry could be run by the government, but maybe thinking more locally or state and local levels, you might see that um, maybe the water or the electricity is run by the city or the county or the state. Um, or it could just be one specific corporation that is representative as a public franchise. So in places that I've lived, it usually is a private company. Uh, and so they basically have a monopoly over providing electricity. Part of that usually arises not just from government lobbying, uh, but it also comes from this concept known as natural monopolies. So a lot of times public franchises come from the fact that natural monopolies exist. And a natural monopoly is a situation in which economies of scale are so large that one firm could supply the entire market at a lower average cost than two or more firms. So going back to that discussion about utilities, think about all of the pipes, all of the easements, all of the land that it takes to get all the wiring and connections in for water or for electricity or for natural gas and all the contracts and all the time that it took and all the costs that it took to uh, make that happen. And so essentially, if you wanted to have an infrastructure that was comparable to that and the government didn't compel you to share the infrastructure that you spent the money to build, and think about how prohibitively expensive it would be for another electric company to build wires side by side to the existing wires to go to your house just so that you could have similar resources. It would be prohibitively expensive and it basically eliminates the competition. So a lot of times natural monopolies and public franchises go hand in hand because of the fact that the government sees, okay, well, this energy company or this water company has all the infrastructure in place, any other competing company, unless we compel them to share their lines, which seems counterintuitive in terms of an economic perspective uh, from a capitalist perspective, um, let's just make them the sole provider. Another type of uh, way in which a monopoly can exist is a network externality. And this is basically a characteristic of a product where its usefulness increases with the number of people that use it. So I think back to social media when I was uh, in high school. So at that time, MySpace was kind of the big uh, social media network. So Instagram didn't exist. Twitter, Twitter barely existed, I think. I think it came out in 2006, so it was barely a thing. YouTube had been around for about three or four years 
but basically Facebook at that time was just kind of limited to colleges and this was the time when they started expanding out into the world beyond college campuses in order to be uh added to Facebook or be able to register for Facebook, you had to be invited by somebody else who was in Facebook. I think Gmail, so everyone has a Gmail account these days, but Gmail, when it first started out in the early 2000s, was similar, where basically if you wanted to get a Google email account, you had to be invited by someone else who had a Google email account. And at that point, I think your uh, email server limit was like two gigabytes and then it just ever expanded i think these days it's in like the 20 or 30 gigs so it's just kind of ever exponentially increasing over time as computing space and computing power increases substantially over time anyways the point of this is is that uh i didn't really want to join facebook i had a friend in high school who was like oh here's this invite so i joined it and i was like this sucks there's nothing here, and I and it's kind of come full circle where I think Facebook sucks so much that I haven't had it in years. But um, that's neither here nor there. Essentially, um, what happened was is I joined Facebook, but I hardly used it because no one was on there. All my friends were on MySpace with our uh, HTML backgrounds that took like three minutes to load and music players automatically playing some popular song at the time or some very angsty teeny emotional song uh regardless um what happened was is facebook started to ever expand basically more people started joining it so it people became more useful and then once all your friends were on it it became much more enjoyable and useful because it was a cleaner interface it was simpler it had some add-ons but it wasn't as clunky as myspace where basically everything would like crash your computer eventually what happened was at that time people were using instant messenger apps like uh, aol instant messenger um to communicate with each other outside of class because text messaging was just starting out so that became a big, big thing. But if you wanted to have a more kind of succinct, quick conversation, uh, instant messaging was the way to go. So that was a third party application that was just kind of sitting on your desktop that you would do and utilize while you were doing your homework or communicating or playing games on your computer, playing video games on your console. And eventually though facebook started instead of having messages they had facebook messenger in this standalone app and that centralized the messaging so that effectively killed the instant messaging function and then as time went on facebook started buying more and more um other companies and other useful things are integrating it into their website and as more and more people were on it it basically made people kind of centralize their base into Facebook. Instead of using other apps or other websites, they get their news from Facebook, they get their weather from Facebook, they get their messaging from Facebook, they can buy pizzas through Facebook. Everything is integrated through that one website. And so the reason why it's kind of enveloped and kind of, it's not necessarily a monopoly, but it's an, definitely in an oligopic space uh, is because of the fact that they've just integrated and there's so many network externalities and convenience. The problem with that is that it's very monocultured and with your ability to kind of pare down the world around you and limiting your sources of information, it's caused a lot of problems in our political uh, climate and also for people just having kind of uh, struggling to get clear information from reputable sources. Um, so that started happening, I think around late 2015, early 2016, I haven't had Facebook since early 2015. So a lot of the changes that have happened that have kind of created those types of problems, um, weren't really there when I was using it, but eventually uh, those things have kind of arisen, but it's still effectively useful. It's very useful to communicate with people and and share ideas um, and be able to do a lot of things that in the past you needed a bunch of other things to do. And think about cell phones. Cell phones, you used to have to 
um, you used to have us have a separate digital camera. You used to have a s separate digital camcorder. You had a laptop and a desktop computer. Uh, and now all that is integrated into one cell phone. So I had bought a digital camera when I graduated high school. And the photo quality on my phone is better than the state-of-the-art digital camera that I bought a few, like long time ago so um all of these integrations make it more useful and it kind of eliminates some competition from other areas that otherwise would be competing with them in terms of cameras or camcorders or even nowadays like tablets and laptops are now competing with cell phones in terms of processing power and functionality uh, because it's so uh versatile nowadays and then the last uh, way in which a monopoly can kind of be created is by owner, owning key resources in production. So um, we talked about this with like De Beers in terms of an OPEC in the oligopoly section. But effectively, um, if you basically have a monopoly on the key resource in the production process, then you're the only person that can really provide it. Or in order for someone else to provide it, they have to get the resource from you. And so that really creates a substantial amount of market power. So ownership of key resources was really kind of why we had antitrust laws that developed that developed in the late 19th and early 20th century, because you had kind of the Rockefellers and Carnegie's monopolizing steel. You had the train industry monopolized. You had the oil industry uh, monopolized. And so... Uh, there was a lot of inefficiencies created in the market because of that and so the government tried to bust the trust and come up with ways to um, create more competition and more efficiency in our uh, economic system so turning our attention from what causes a monopoly to actually how we analyze one um, this portion is going to be very similar to what we talked about with monopolistic competition. In fact, it's gonna be exactly the same. Profit maximization, uh, because when you have a monopoly, you have a downward sloping demand curve and then by effect, a downward sloping marginal revenue curve that changes at a rate faster than demand changes. You're going to analyze profit maximization the exact same way. Uh, profit maximizing level of output occurs at the point where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So if you look at the left side graph, the profit maximizing level of output is going to be at point A, which is going to represent six subscriptions for this magazine. So the profit maximizing level of output is to provide six subscriptions. Now again, unlike with perfect competition where the marginal revenue curve and the demand curve are the same, in order for us to determine price at that corresponding profit maximizing level of output, we have to go up to the demand curve and over. So for example, for point A, we got to go up to B and then over to determine the actual price, which is going to be $42. So again, it would be incorrect to say that the price is $27. That's just the marginal revenue for the sixth, uh, for the sixth uh, unit sold, which is the same as the marginal cost of that sixth unit sold. Now again, in order for us to determine whether the firm is making money or not, we're going to compare uh price with average total cost so average total cost isn't listed in the left side graph but it's existing in the right side graph so we're going to compare average total cost at point uh excuse me at six units uh, and compare that point b which is 42 dollars with the average total cost at that sixth unit which is 30 dollars and so that means that the firm is making 12 dollars per unit so again profits is uh, price minus average total cost, all times Q star. So in this example, we're going to have 12 times 6, which is $72 in profit. So go monopolist. Um, now the question is, what's the big deal? How do we demonstrate that monopolies are problematic? So we have a board game that shows the contention that monopolists create uh, we have laws in place that try to mitigate the 
prevalence of monopolies. So if our graph is show, looks exactly like it would be in a monopolistically competitive space, then what's the big deal? How are monopolies bad? Why are they bad? And the reality is, is that we have to look at the fact that when you have a monopoly, you have only one firm, which means that we actually know what market supply and market demand are because before with monopolistic competition, there might have been a market for hamburgers, but your hamburger is slightly differentiated enough where you have your own specific individual firm demand and you have your own individual supply curve. And we don't necessarily exactly know what the profit maximizing, or excuse me, not the profit maximizing, the uh, market equilibrium, the allocatively efficient solution for the market is. We did establish when we compared perfectly competitive long run outcomes to uh, monopolistically competitive long run outcomes that perfectly competitive markets are productively efficient because they produce at minimum average total cost, but uh, monopolistically competitive uh, firms are not productively efficient because they don't produce at minimum average total cost. Same is going to be true for a um, monopoly, they're not going to be producing a minimum average total cost, and as a result, they're going to be non-productively efficient. However, there is a chance of allocative efficiency in a monopolistic competition space, and it's definitely there in a perfectly competitive space, as demonstrated by the equilibrium determining the market price that the firm takes. But for a monopoly, we know be because of the fact that there's only one firm, the market demand curve is the same as the firm's demand curve. And we know that the market supply curve is going to be the same as the firm's marginal cost curve, because if a firm's supply curve is its marginal cost curve, then the entire market supply curve is going to be that marginal cost curve. So the intersection of the demand curve and the marginal cost curve is actually what the market equilibrium is. But that's not where we actually produce that, because the firm is not interested in maximum social welfare it's interested in maximum personal profits and so as a result a monopoly is not allocatively efficient it's effectively almost as if we had a price floor or a price ceiling that was created by the firm and so here's here's a way we can actually demonstrate it so again uh, QM is going to represent the point where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That's the profit maximizing level of output for a monopolist. And then the actual price that they charge, we have to go up to the corresponding demand curve and go over. So PM represents the monopolist price at that profit maximizing level of output. However, because the monopoly is the only firm that's producing the good or service, the marginal cost curve is the market supply, and the demand curve is the market demand. And as we learned before, the allocatively efficient solution in the market equilibrium occurs at the point where quantity supplied is equal to quantity demanded, which is the intersection point of those two curves. So if we look at that intersection point, QC is going to be the market equilibrium allocatively efficient uh, level of output and PC is going to be the uh, market equilibrium price. Now, obviously, we're not producing there. So PM is much higher than PC, so the price is higher. And QM is much lower than QC. So the problem of monopolists is they charge too much and they produce too little. And the way we can visualize that is by looking at that yellow triangle. Again, when we don't achieve a market equilibrium, there's going to be a dead weight loss that occurs. We talked about this with externalities. We talked about this with um, price floors and price ceilings and taxes. If we're not operating at our efficient solution, there's going to be dead weight loss. Now, in cases of externalities or price ceilings, there might be a uh, underlying social goal that we decide is more equitable and we want to trade that efficiency for equity but in this case the monopoly is just doing its thing trying to follow its incentive pattern and as a result triangle the sum of triangles b and c is dead weight loss that exists because those units are not going to be produced and sold anymore furthermore on top of that uh we can look at PM and PC and look at that difference in that rectangle that's indicated by uh, A and red 
shows you that some of the economic surplus that still remains that would be there whether or not we produced at monopoly uh, profit max or at market equilibrium that is going to be economic surplus that still exists but that economic surplus now goes from consumers to the firm so one of the problems with social welfare calculations is that economic surplus uh overall doesn't really distinguish between consumer and producer so in this uh, to this effect um there's something that's known as pareto optimality and pareto optimality doesn't distinguish between one person holding all the wealth and everyone having an equal distribution of it so this is another example of that where okay the level of economic surplus is the same but the problem is is that by not producing at that market equilibrium you're getting the initial loss and in economic surplus from the dead weight loss indicated by triangles b and c but you're also losing from a consumer perspective because you're paying more than you would have uh, some consumer surplus to you so that is extra revenue that goes in the pocket of the monopoly that otherwise would have been extra savings that went to the consumer if we were operating at market equilibrium. So again, these are the negative consequences of monopolies in which, and this is why they're frowned upon and discouraged generally by society. But as I mentioned before, there are some reasons why in which we would include them, whether it's because they have such high economies of scale, it's prohibitively expensive for a competitor to exist, or because of the fact that maybe we have patent rights or copyright rights or trademark rights that allow for the firm to have some sort of uh, temporary monopoly to incentivize them to continue to push the needle forward in development and research that helps kind of promote the useful arts, of, in, arts and sciences as is written in the Constitution. So that concludes our lecture here on monopoly. If you have any questions, again, please feel free to reach out. Otherwise, I wish you the best of luck on your assessments and any other courses that you may have.